Welcome to Sight and Sound Bites. This is the INEAR Foundation's new bi-weekly uh, lunchtime educational webinar series of the research and clinical innovations at the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine. Today's topic is a very popular one, which is why we have uh, record attendance for today's webinar, and the topic is on age-related macular degeneration. I'm Lawton Snyder, the CEO of the INEAR Foundation. The INEAR Foundation supports research to advance care for vision, hearing, balance, voice, and cancers of the head and neck. We work closely with the two world-renowned departments of otolaryngology and ophthalmology at the University of Pittsburgh. The funds we provide annually to these two departments stimulate and advance groundbreaking research, and that support is only possible because of philanthropic donations. So thank you to all of those who have been supporting the research that you're gonna hear about today. Before we start today's program, I need to go over a few of the housekeeping items. Um, this uh, is a Zoom product. You recognize it. We're all doing a lot of Zoom and these types of, of programs now. Um, this uh, does not have the chat enabled. So when you see chat on the bottom, you won't be able to use chat, but you can, uh, the button that says Q&A on the bottom, you can click on to ask questions. We will answer questions at the end of today's program. Uh, please save your questions to the end. We will ask that you uh, refrain from, um, from asking personal health questions. I'll actually have to, I'll go over, I'll uh, pass over those uh, for more questions related to general, um, you know, uh, advancements and, and questions related to what we're doing to advance research. And, uh, but, if you have personal questions, and, and uh, we can certainly refer you to people that can help you through the clinical services at UPMC Eye Center. Tomorrow you receive a survey via email to provide us with feedback. You'll also be added to our email list to receive future webinars. I'm gonna ask Dr. Jose Elaine Sahel, our distinguished professor and chairman for the Department of Ophthalmology the University of Pittsburgh School of Medicine, exceptional class professor at Sorbonne University in Paris, and the INEA Foundation Endowed Chair to introduce today's topic and today's speakers. I wanna thank Dr. Sal for moderating today's discussion because I know he has dedicated his life to helping patients with degenerative retinal conditions and is a world leading expert on this topic. I also know he is deeply committed to making Pittsburgh the leading research center in the world for groundbreaking transformative and translational technologies to restore vision. And it is his leadership, knowledge, and skills that are already leading us in that direction. Thank you, Dr. Sell. And, and Dr. Sell, you know this, this is something that very personally to me, I'm interested in. Uh, my mother had severe macular degeneration and, and we all wanna know what our team here at the University of Pittsburgh is doing to uh, make it an impact for the patients uh, suffering with this condition. Well, thank you very much. Uh, welcome everyone. We are very pleased to share with you uh, the clinical and research work we are conducting on this uh, condition. Age-related macular degeneration has become uh, the first cause of uh, visual impairment in our countries. And uh, although we made uh, significant progress in understanding the disease and uh, already developing some therapies over the past decade, uh, there is still a lot of work that is ongoing and a lot of work which is needed to cope with this uh, very, very devastating condition in the lives of many people. As you will see, there is a spectrum in the disease from very early stages that can be quite mild to more advanced stages that require intervention. Sometimes we have already intervention, sometimes we don't yet have them. But as, we, as you will see, and if you stay up to the end, you'll be really happy to see that amazing advances are ongoing that are really providing a lot of hope for all of us to be able to cope with the disease. So for this webinar, we assembled a team of clinicians and scientists working in the department to give you a flavor of the integration between clinical and research activities we have. Uh, you'll have a very nice introduction to the disease by Tom Freiberg, who is a well-known, worldwide well-known uh, expert in the field of retina disease. He's the head of a retina division, and he will give you a background of all the studies. Some of them he was actually instrumental in conducting in Pittsburgh. 
you'll hear Dr. Debashi Sinha, but we recruited him from Hopkins a couple of years ago. He's a world expert in the field of research on the mechanisms leading to vision loss in age-related macular degeneration, but also identifying new therapies. And he could talk at length on many of his approaches, but we asked him to stay focused on a few of them only just to give you a, a flavor of what is going on in the department. And you'll hear Dr. Yossi Martel telling you about the existing therapies but at the end also, but very, very promising advances that are ongoing in Pittsburgh, first in the US, uh, approaches to restore vision in patients with advanced age-related macular degeneration. This will be just a work in progress seminar, many more things to do, many more questions that remain open. We are trying to leave enough time at the end so that you can ask questions through the Q&R and uh, we'll be happy to address any of these today or later if needed. So we'll start with Tom Freiberg our professor and director for retinal service uh, about the disease itself. Thank you, Dr. Sahil. We can go right to the slides. When we talk about macular degeneration, we have to know a little bit about the anatomy of the eye. The eye is a sphere and the wallpaper of the eye is the retina. It's like the film in the camera. So light comes through the cornea and the lens and goes through the retina until it gets to the rods and cones deeper in the retina. And when it hits the rods and cones, the uh, light is changed into an electrical signal, which is sent to the, via the optic nerve to the brain. Next. So the macula is actually a place in the retina. It's the central part of the retina, the part of the eye that we need in order to read, to look at faces across the room, and to do fine detailed work. Next. So the macula can be degenerated by several processes. One is deposition of yellow deposits called drusen, or else you can get pigmentary changes shown on the right with hyperpigmentation and some atrophy. Next. So here is a picture of many drusen in an eye with AMD. Next. And here's a couple more. The one on the right, you see some atrophy as well, as well as drusen. Next. Here's a lot more drusen in an eye. Next. And if you look at the entire eye, if you take a picture of the entire retina, people with macular degeneration often have some pigmentary changes in the periphery as well. Next. If you look at electron microscopy, you, you see that drusen are tiny little excrescences that are on the surface of the basement membrane. Next. So if we look at this cartoon, the rods and cones are in blue. Underneath are the hexagonal cells, which make up the RPE layer. And then below that is Brooks membrane. So over time, the rods and cones undergo a lot of uh, duress and uh, lots of wear and tear through a lifetime. And a lot of the material, the cellular material has to be recycled in order to keep things working well. Next. If, if the recycling is imperfect or if your enzymes get a little bit tired, you start developing you know, deposits along Brooks membrane. Next. These deposits can interfere a bit with nutrition. Below the Brooks membrane is the choroid, which is the part of the uh, eye that provides oxygenation and nutrition to the outer third of the retina. Next. Over time, it's also possible for blood vessels from the choroidal side to grow underneath the retina. Next. And that's called wet macular degeneration. So here in the cartoon, you see all these vessels. Next. And there are two primary kinds of macular degeneration. One is the atrophic time type, which is mostly atrophy and pigmentation changes. But if you get the vascular type or the neovascular type, you have to have that treated pretty quickly, otherwise you're gonna lose vision within the year most likely. Whereas the geographic type can take a long time to lose vision if you're going to lose vision. Next. So here's an eye that had hemorrhage from neovascularization. Next. This eye had scarring from previous neovascularization. Next. This eye has dramatic scarring. You can imagine the vision is impaired here. Next. If you looked at an AMSR grid or a graph paper, it looks quite nice. But if you have macular degeneration of the wet kind, next, you see some distortions and some uh, 
dark spots within, within the grid. Next. There are a variety of ways to treat macular degeneration historically. Now we primarily treat wet with injections. Next. I also spent some time uh, as a principal investigator checking whether vitamins and minerals have a role in macular degeneration management. Next. So it was a big randomized study. We had lots of patients, different stages of macular degeneration from hardly having any as shown here. Next, to have progressively more macular degeneration. Next, and this study was multi-centered. It was a big study. Next, we studied the ARES-1 formula. Next, vitamins and minerals. Next, it was randomized, which is an important thing. Next, and the take home message from this trial was, yes, indeed, if you have macular degeneration, you should be on vitamins and minerals, and that would decrease your risk of losing vision over a seven year period by about 20%, whether it's the dry kind or the wet kind. Next. 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 When we see you in the clinic, we often do an OCT, a special imaging test, to see whether you have fluid or blood vessels underneath the retina. Now, Dabashish will tell you more about the basic science of macular degeneration. Thanks very much, Dr. Freiburg. Uh, thank you, Professor Shohel and Lonnie. Good afternoon, everyone. So in the initial stages of drug development for AMD, researchers focused on understanding which cells of the retina were affected by the uh, disease. Now, however, most of the studies were a bit biased since they were more interested in the cells that they already studied. So as shown in this cartoon here, it is more like, I, this is like the Indian animal fable, Panchatantra, when a blindfolded individual was um, asked which part of the elephant they were touching, even when they were holding the tail, they said it was the trunk, since they liked the trunk. Next, please. Uh, so, nevertheless, the data obtained from such studies did advance in our understanding of this debilitating disease and the main cause of vision loss in older Americans. So, several famous artists were affected by AMD. As for example, as shown here, the world-renowned painter, Georgia O'Keeffe, who has been recognized as the mother of American modernism, lost her vision to AMD. And as you can see in your right-hand side, I, that you know, when she was working on the famous Black Rock series, she did not realize that she had macular degeneration then. And you can see that she had lost her central vision. And, and later she was diagnosed was at the age of 77 of AMD. What I want to emphasize is that the number of AMD patients is equivalent to all invasive cancers combined, and more than double that of Alzheimer's disease. As, next, please. Um, so uh, in the last two decades, have you then made any progress? And the answer is yes. We know now many pathways that are implicated in AMD pathobiology. So is the metabolism in the retina abnormal? Is it oxidative stress? Is it and uh, the mitochondrial dysfunction. So is it like uh, the powerhouse is abnormal, the energy producing, the lipid abnormalities, the immune system. So we know more because in the several mutations in complement has been shown to result in AMD, then inflammasome and lysosomal dysfunction. Next, please. Uh, so what we don't know, the key unknowns and what should we, we are prioritizing now is what is the relative contribution of each pathologic process. So when we talk about, about mitochondrial dysfunction or oxidative stress or the immune system, what, what plays a role in different stages of the disease? We have to also know, do these processes interact with one another? So if there is a lysosomal abnormality and we fix the lysosomal abnormality, can the clearance of the mitochondrial dysfunction be clear, can be taken care of? Next slide, please. So we definitely know now, now the risk factors uh, that affect uh, this disease. So the greatest risk factor we know now is aging. 
So it is very uncommon in uh, individuals less than the age of 55, but most common uh, for ages above 75. Smoking is the second most common risk factor. It has a twofold increased risk. And many of the risk factors that we know uh, now, uh, now actually uh, seems to affect uh, the real function of the genes through a mechanism where the multiple promotin and is abnormal in to, for the gene function. So it is like an additional step that the genes use for functional abilities. Is, and and in, the la, in the department, and, um, and Dr. Al Aldiri is actually looking into the uh, chromatin accessibility. Next slide, please. So what we now know for sure uh, is that uh, the, uh, in the early or the dry form of the disease, the retinal pigmented epithelium is fast affected. And this comes from the seminal work by Jan Chan at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. And we had the pleasure of also uh, looking into it where he actually showed, uh, and that next, if you can just push two for this layer. So where he actually showed that the RP changes occur before retinal changes because the chromatin accessibility becomes abnormal earlier in RP cells in this disease which implicates that the RP as a driver of early AMD pathobiology. And, and uh, so we are mostly fo focusing on lysosomes, which I will tell, let you know, uh, discuss in the next uh, uh, sort of my talk. Next slide, please. So, uh, so uh, uh, what do uh, we do for this disease? And it is very well put by one of my collaborators and a good friend, who is an amazing clinical a clinician scientist and now heads the retina division at Johns Hopkins. He says the disease is like the four bottles of life. You know, you use each bottle at different stage of your life. So as Dr. Freiberg mentioned about the IRADS vitamins, the IRADS vitamins are important uh, at the intermediate stage of the disease, but doesn't work at the dry or and the wet form. Again, he talked about anti-VGF, which works for the wet form, but not in other stages of the disease. So we have to look at the processes that we all know that which stage is important for which contribution to from which pathway. So with that, I will now pass it to uh, Dr. Martel for, uh, the, you know, for to tell us about the existing treatment in AMD. Thank you, Dr. Sina. Welcome to everyone. Uh, Dr. Sina and Dr. Freiberg uh, gave a nice overview of the biology uh, of macular degeneration. I'm going to discuss uh, some of the available treatments and um, some of the new innovations, as well as some of the uh, voids and treatments that we need to work on from a research perspective. So uh, age-related macular degeneration uh, treatment is catered toward the stage of the disease and also the disease sub subtype. Many of you know that uh, clinical progression and severity of the disease is quite variable. Some patients have relatively mild disease with slow progression, and other patients develop severe disease and more rapid progression. In patients with the early form of macular degeneration, they may not even have many symptoms or any symptoms at all. They may not even notice there's any problem with the vision. The treatment for early AMD is aimed more at prevention and mitigation of the risk factors. And the basis uh, for the treatment in early AMD is more nutritional therapies. So a healthy diet that's high in uh, antioxidants. A Mediterranean diet is great. So a diet that's composed of fruits, vegetables, uh, and fish, in particular, uh, omega-3 fatty acids, which is a common uh, fatty acid found in fish. And then Dr. Freiberg talked about the importance of the AREDS formulation of vitamins, a formulation of vitamins that consists of various antioxidants and also some macular pigments like uh, lutein and zeaxanthine. And then we know that smoking is a risk factor for development of macular degeneration. So once patients have macular degeneration, in particular the early form, uh, smoking cessation efforts are very important. And then UV protection, we know just in general, uh, UV protection and overexposure uh, to the retina and the eye is not a good thing. So when you're out in the, in the bright sunlight, uh, wearing sunglasses is important. And then certainly surveillance. So there are home surveillance tools uh, as simple as using a, a, a special grid called, called an Amsler grid, uh, where you, you look at the uh, vertically and horizontally oriented lines and try to identify any subtle changes in those lines. 
Uh, and then there's some innovations um, with you know, phone applications uh, that will uh, allow you to do some home surveillance, and those are sort of in development. And then Dr. Freiberg talked a little bit about some of the retinal imaging. In terms of surveillance uh, in the office, we, we do the retinal imaging uh, to help us identify disease progression, but also if there's any evidence of any wet macular degeneration that uh, would change the treatment plan, uh, it's important to identify those changes early. Next slide, please. So uh, there are, in today's world, there are a few mainstay treatments for the more severe forms of macular degeneration. And those severe forms uh, are basically two subtypes. Most people have the dry form of macular degeneration, but about 10 to 15% of people have what we term wet macular degeneration. And wet macular degeneration is termed wet because there are abnormal blood vessels in association with the macular degeneration that leak and bleed. And that leaking and bleeding can cause damage to the retina. Uh, in patients with advanced atrophic macular degeneration, atrophy just means that there's significant loss of tissue in the macula. Patients tend to have more detrimental issues with fine details in vision. For wet macular degeneration in today's world, the mainstay therapy is uh, injections of medication inside the eye that block uh, a, a vascular growth factor important for the maintenance and development of those abnormal blood vessels. And then certainly there's a role uh, for low vision rehabilitation, um, special glasses, special devices, uh, and then in severe cases, um, vision training for both the wet and the advanced dry form. Certainly there's a role for the ARETS vitamins in both cases. Next slide, please. So we've come a long way. For wet macular degeneration, the FDA approved treatment in 1979 was what we term laser photocoagulation therapy, where we would literally burn the abnormal blood vessels. The issue is that it would cause a lot of collateral damage and help precipitate, unfortunately, the degeneration and the atrophy of the adjacent tissue. And Oftentimes, these abnormal blood vessels would keep recurring and coming back. The analogy I like to use for this type of treatment is that if you had a stain in the carpet, ideally, you'd want to take a surgical approach. You'd want to remove that stain without damaging the underlying carpet. You could achieve the same objective of removing the stain by pouring a little bit of gas on the carpet, and lighting it on fire. You've removed the stain, but you've also irreversibly damaged the carpet. So we've come uh, in 2000, there was a sort of a more precise uh, laser therapy where a special dye was injected in the vein that went to the eye and then was activated in a precise manner by a special type of laser treatment. This also did, in some cases, cause some collateral damage, but certainly less than the previous laser therapies. But also, uh, there was still a recurrence of those abnormal blood vessels. Then in 2004, there was the FDA approval, interestingly enough, of a colon cancer drug. And the way that the colon cancer drug worked is that it blocked some of the abnormal blood vessels associated with the rapid growth of the colon cancer and helped with treatment of the colon cancer. And when it was tested in the eye, it actually helped treat some of the abnormal blood vessels associated with wet macular degeneration. Next slide, please. So today, this anti-VEGF therapy, so anti-vascular endothelial growth factor therapy, is the most important therapy uh, for wet macular degeneration. And nowadays, there are basically four different drugs that we use. The most commonly used drugs today are the Avastin and the ILEA. Often there's debate about you know, which drug works better, um, you know, it's one of those things where there have been a lot of studies done, and the bottom line is they're all uh, pretty much the same in terms of efficacy, but there are certain patients, perhaps, that one drug may work better than the other. Unfortunately, it's not the type of medication that can be delivered easily with a pill or an eye drop. It actually has to be injected into the jelly in the eye in order to reach its target in the retina. And then importantly, it's a treatment, but it's not a cure, unfortunately, and it requires chronic therapy. So once the medication is withdrawn, washes out of the eye, it's important to re-inject that medication. Otherwise, those abnormal blood vessels will just keep coming back. Next slide, please. 
in addition, in addition to these therapies in patients with severe loss of vision, where they've lost a lot of the fine details in vision, it's also important to maximize the function of their remaining visual capabilities. And this can be achieved um, by special types of equipment, like special lenses. Sometimes we can tweak the glasses. We can often put in magnifiers. There are new electronic systems that magnify things. Um, there are many systems in development to help patients with, with low vision issues. Um, there are implantable telescopes. There are telescopes that can be used on the glasses. And then there are um, occupational therapists that specialize in training for patients that have vision difficulties to help them navigate their environment a little bit better. Um, in our department, we're, we're really fortunate to have uh, Dr. William Smith uh, lead the uh, low vision therapy division um, and work with a multidisciplinary team of low vision occupational therapists. Dr. Smith's one of the best in the country um, and he's involved uh, not only in, in macular degeneration, but many other uh, low vision uh, issues and diseases. Next slide, please. There's certainly room for advancements um, and better treatments. Um, even for wet macular degeneration, you know, these drugs, they need to, you need to keep coming in and getting these injections. It's, they're quite cumbersome. There's uh, certainly uh, uh, some discomfort associated with those injections. And, you know, there are some issues with durability. You know, there are some patients that need the injections every single month. Um, and, you know, for the long term. Uh, so if there are new drugs, perhaps that could target um, other uh, molecules, um, or if the pharmacokinetics of the drugs would uh, be enhanced such that they would last longer in the eye, uh, that would uh, decrease the treatment burden. Um, there are uh, new drugs in the pipeline that are in clinical trials. Most of those drugs do not make it along, uh, but we're certainly hopeful uh, that there will be new drugs and new therapies for wet macular degeneration. And even some gene therapies are in the pipeline as well. It's too early to tell whether or not uh, they're safe and efficacious, but uh, they're definitely on the horizon. For the advanced form of dry macular degeneration, basically, you know, there are a couple of approaches. In the early stages, we wanna to try to protect things. We wanna to try to prevent the vision loss and the damage to the tissue. Um, so neuroprotection uh, agents are, are looked at commonly. But what do we do once the retina is damaged? Unfortunately, the retina is a special tissue in the body. It doesn't have the capability of regenerating itself. So once it's gone, it doesn't grow back. So uh, that's the main issue in, in patients with advanced atrophic macular degeneration is how do we regenerate the retina? And certainly there are uh, treatments and a lot of research going into stem cell therapies. Um, but also a, a, big, um, a big area of interest is artificial retina. So if we can't replace the retina uh, with its own tissue, maybe we could replace it with an artificial prosthetic device. And I'll be talking a little bit more at the end of the talk of one recent breakthrough uh, here in Pittsburgh of a retinal prosthetic device, a, a chip that we implant in patients with uh, advanced dry macular degeneration to help uh, restore vision. Because ultimately that's what we wanna do. We wanna try to not just preserve vision, but in patients with end stage disease, we wanna actually restore vision as well. Next slide, please. I'm gonna turn it back over to Dr. Cena to continue with the talk, more about some age-related macular degeneration research efforts. And then I'll talk later about the recent breakthrough in vision restoration. Thank you very much, Dr. Martel. Uh, so as you have heard from both Dr. Martel and, um, and Dr. Freiberg that uh, it is a complicated path to AMD therapies. One big reason being and the disease uh, presents a pathology that is very complex. So you have heard about Drusen from both of us, uh, but even in Drusen, you can see as shown in the cartoon here that there are large hard Drusen, there are Drusenoid deposits, uh, and there are many other things that happen. So that makes, makes it very difficult to have a single drug or to identify a drug that will help it, uh, with all the pathology. The next uh, complex thing is that uh, how once you find a drug, how you put, get it into the eye. So there are many uh, ways you can do it, but you can uh, really see that the cell or the uh, protein that you are wanting to uh, affect, if you can get it done in the right way. Uh, next slide, please. So, however, uh, 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 there has been therapeutic breakthroughs 
uh, uh, all over with from labs, excellent labs around the world. And uh, I am hopeful that uh, there will be a, a dry AMD and a breakthrough soon. And one of the examples, if I give, is as the company Apple is, has come up uh, with a complement inhibitor, C3 inhibitor, that they reported in the ophthalmology journal in February of 2020, and it's very, really very promising. And, and this website that I put up here, if anybody is interested, can go in there and look into what actually are in, are in the pipeline. So what has been done here in our department? So under the leadership of Professor Shohel, which you have already heard, he had an interest in retinal indigenous over many, many years. And with Professor Jeff Gross, uh, who is the scientific director, an amazing scientist himself, a very young team has been uh, <coughs> gathered together in the department. And they're all looking at multiple targets um, they are investigating to develop drugs. Uh, so, as Dr. Mortel said, new protection is very important, and, and uh, as I already mentioned, Dr. Isam Aldiri is actually looking into promotion accessibility and trying to treat uh, the, the damaged neurons in the retina from this disease. Leah Bond, who is an amazing gene therapist, is actually using gene therapy to uh, rescue the, uh, the neurons. And Dr. Susanna De Silva is looking into cell-based um, therapies, and, and it is unique. It's not the tra a traditional cell-based therapy that many people are doing stem cells, Dr. Martel also talked about, but she's looking into a specific area of the retina. She's looking into the phobia, the cone cells, so if she can regenerate those cells. Then Dr. Yuanan Chen is actually looking at visual cycle modulators. Uh, she focuses on uh, pharmacological uh, <coughs> uh, insights, and she already has uh, many small molecules uh, so that she is testing for this disease. Jeff has a very unique uh, model that he works on, the zebrafish that regenerate. So he's taking cues from um, this regenerating and RP cells in zebrafish to look into if there is some immune cell regulators like chemokines or cytokines that can do regeneration. So he is looking into that. And um, Dr. Leger is already a star in our department. He was recently in Time magazine. So he has a unique also way of uh, looking into the disease where or retinal degenerative diseases in particular uh, where he is using the ocular microbiome uh, um, to uh, to link it with the uh, immune system because the immune system plays an important role in this disease and I'm sure very soon he will come with uh, very interesting targets. So we uh, actually in our laboratory are focusing on lysosomes in the retinal pigmented epithelial cells as I have already told you that these cells are affected first in the dry form of the disease. Next slide please. So why lysosomes? So as we like to eat, um, um, the cells also like to eat. In, in fact, the retinal pigmental uh, epithelial cells in that eats about 40,000 photoreceptor outer segments per day. And the whole process is like as we go to the market and how we eat is more or less the cells do the same thing in a way. Uh, so as shown in the um, cartoons on the left, and uh, so you go to the grocery store or the farmer's market and you buy things that you like. So it is like those vegetables and everything have what is called find me signals. So you find them. So as shown in the cartoon in green, so those are the outer, outer segments which, pro, uh, which show those type of signals. Then you bring the food to, the, uh, to your house and then you process it and uh, you try and you eat it. Uh, so that's why it's called the eat me signal. So the signal and that uh, <coughs> the outer segment approach, the RP cells are then engulfing in the food. And after that, after the engulfment is ha ha has happened, it's the same thing that after you take, eat your food, it goes from your mouth to the digestive system. Here also, uh, the food goes from, the, the, uh, the cargo goes uh, from the uh, top of the cell, the apical side to the bottom of the uh, cell. But here, one interesting thing that occurs in cells that it requires a garbage truck, the lysosomes, uh, which is a garbage clearing agent in the cells, so uh, organelle. Uh, so they fuse with the 
cargo and then they are degraded. So you know, one, so on many of these processes, the cell has a very interesting system process that controls many of these physiological processes, which is called autophagy. So auto uh, means self, so it's self-eating. So when you are cooking, you replenish uh, regularly your utensils that you cook with, you do, you, know, you buy new utensils, uh, sometimes you, you know, also do other things. So autophagy is like that. Autophagy is clearing all the proteins that is required for the phagocytosis process. As it also uh, makes new uh, organelles for, for the cell to, you know, to survive. But one thing which is very important that however in the phagocytosis process the cargo is formed, the phag is called phagosome or in, in in the autophagy process, the autophagosome, they have to, they have to fuse with lysosomes. And we and many other laboratories have shown that in AMD actually, this and the final degradation becomes problem. And we believe that maybe that is one of the reasons why drusen is formed. And it is also known that when we age, the number of lysosome decreases. And in the aging, uh, most of the aging diseases, including Alzheimer's disease and now in AMD also, it depletes significantly. So we have identified a protein which we can engineer in a way that actually helps, uh, the, um, helps um, uh, the autophagy process to make new lysosomes. So this has been now patented by University of Pittsburgh and licensed by Astellas which is the second largest pharmaceutical company uh, in Japan, where we are trying to do this increase in the number of lysosomes in the RP cells. And we are very hopeful uh, that uh, as early as 2022, we can take this uh, product into uh, for clinical trial. We are also working very closely with Hoffman La Roche, where we are using many of their drugs from their immunology portfolio and ophthalmology to look into this fusion process and also in the immune system. The second, next slide, please. So you know, the focus of the lab is actually rejuvenating uh, the lysosomes, but also in particular to uh, you know regenerate or the RP functions because the RP is damaged in this cell. So this may not be actually uh, you know curing the disease, but we believe what can happen is um, is like it can and slow the progression of the disease. So if you are getting uh, the disease around 65 or 70, and if we can slow the disease to, uh, by another 10, 15 years, we believe that it would be helpful for the patients who lose their vision. So uh, as in shown here in, uh, in the middle of this slide, we have ma made uh, mice that uh, show AMD-like phenotypes. So these are mice, they have just some, um, symptoms uh, like some stages of the AMD, but they do not really have AMD. So as you can see here, since I have, don't have the cursor, you can see if you compare the left control mice at 12 months with the middle, you can see that there are patches in the RP cell. So the RP as it is identified, you can see it's a single layer of cells and you can see patches and you can also see what is called on a hump, which is, which is known as basal laminar deposit. So this is like drusen. But after treatment, and we can see, you can see uh, that we can actually rescue the RP function completely. So we, we are trying many different ways to, uh, to figure out that how can we rejuvenate and make no, the RP function normally uh, find initially in these animal models and then take it to human patients. So we are fortunate. We are also partnering with many companies here in, uh, in Pittsburgh uh, and all the other funding that we have. And I'm really indebted to the Salvetti family, to Dr. Ron Salvetti and Dr. Jennifer Salvetti for the philanthropy they are, they are providing to our lab because without that, we could not do what we, um, we, we can do now. So next slide, please. So uh, nothing would be uh, possible without this amazing group of scientists in the lab who are talented, dedicated, and the, with the main goal of curing retinal degenerative diseases. I also want to thank the, my collaborators 
who are uh, who have like excellent labs and also involved art in in AMD research, the I N E R Foundation, and and the outstanding help that I receive uh, from and, um, the departmental research uh, administrators, unconditional Amy Phillips from the Economic Partnership here at UPMC and Maria Venegas from the UPMC Innovative Institute. What I want to again focus on is that I have to showed you amazing talented young scientists that when recruited by uh, Professor Shohel and Gross and they need your philanthropy support because one day they were the people who will find a cure uh, for the uh, disease. So with that, as, as Dr. Martel said, he's going to take, talk to you about a new therapy that he and Professor Shoel has developed. Thank you. All right, thank you, Dr. Sina. So I just wanna underscore the importance of finding a safe and effective treatment for actually restoring some sight in patients with very advanced um, atrophic macular degeneration for which uh, that particular disease, there's really not much um, that can be done. Um, we've recently had uh, an, a very important milestone uh, here in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh has been, and our institution has been one of the leaders in vision restoration therapies. Um, as soon as Dr. Sahel uh, joined uh, as, as chairman of our department. Um, many of you may have seen sort of the news story, uh, I think it was back in January, about us being the first in the US uh, to implant a, a microchip, a wireless microchip underneath the retina in the area of macular degeneration to try to restore some sight in, in patients with very advanced disease. Uh, next slide, please. So this chip is basically a system. So it's called PRIMA, P-R-I-M-A. And the system aims to elicit useful bionic vision or artificial vision by electrical stimulation of the damaged retina. And the Prima system, it basically has three elements. It's a wireless retinal uh, chip that's implanted in the area of macular degeneration, and it works together with an augmented reality-like transparent pair of glasses that has a camera and a digital projector. And then uh, there's also a, a, a CPU pocket processor about the size of an iPhone that patients wear uh, that helps process some of the images. Next slide, please. So the implant, it actually works similar to a solar panel. Basically captures light energy and converts that light energy into electrical impulses. The implant itself is quite small. It's about two millimeters by two millimeters and it's, it's razor thin. It's about 30 microns thick which is about uh, you know, less than a 30th the size of a millimeter. And that's surgically implanted in a minimally invasive way underneath the retina in the area um, uh, compromised by the macular degeneration. Next slide, please. So basically the way it works is there's a mini camera in these augmented reality light glasses which captures the visual scene in, in the environment. And the visual scene is then processed and simplified by a pocket computer. Pocket computers equipped with algorithms from artificial intelligence in order to extract the useful information from the images. Those images are then simplified and then sent back to the glasses where there is a miniaturized infrared projector that then communicates with pulses of infrared light through the pupil and with the surgically implanted uh, chip in the area of macular degeneration. That chip, again, acts sort of like a solar panel. It has many different what we call photovoltaic cells, cells that basically capture the light and convert that light into electrical impulses. And that electrical stimulation excites the nerve cells in the inner retina, which in macular degeneration are relatively preserved. And that subsequently induces visual perception along the optic nerve and into the brain. Next slide, please. So it's quite a breakthrough, actually. Um, I think that this is one of the future uh, treatments for uh, very advanced macular degeneration. Um, and it's, this particular device is, is the first wireless model. And uh, we've been able to implant it here in Pittsburgh, uh, even uh, under local anesthesia. So patients can even be awake during the procedure. Um, it's implanted uh, with a target area under the area of macular degeneration 
Um, there have been previous attempts at, at different types of implants uh, outside the eye or on top of the retina. And this is just sort of more physiological in terms of the biology of the visual pathway of putting it underneath the retina. And the unique thing for macular degeneration is this chip and this device works in tandem with the remaining peripheral vision. So many of you may know that uh, macular degeneration principally affects the fine details in the center vision, but no, most people, in fact, almost nobody goes completely blind from macular degeneration because there's some intact peripheral vision uh, that remains. And uh, the engineering of this device with the uh, transparent glasses allows patients to learn how to use this artificial vision in tandem with their remaining peripheral vision to try to get them uh, to function better and to enhance visual function. Next slide, please. Next slide. So here's just an animation of, of how uh, the device is implanted uh, you can see the device here. It's, uh, there's a procedure where there's fluid injected under the area of macular degeneration and the small chip is placed underneath. Next slide. So, so far there have been seven patients implanted with this device uh, in France and uh, in, in Pittsburgh. And uh, so far the uh, safety profile has been quite good. Uh, the vision function has exceeded expectations and it's certainly a, an important milestone and advancement for vi vision restoration and something that I'm personally quite excited about. Um, and uh, there will be certainly more patients um, who will have the benefit of this device and further advancements. Next slide, please. This is, a, this is actually a picture of uh, what things look like post-operatively. This is one of our patients here in Pittsburgh. You can see this yellow uh, sort of shiny device. It's actually underneath the retina. And there's this area of macular degeneration in the very center. And on the bottom, there's a picture of the microanatomy of the retina um, obtained by that optical coherence or OCT imaging. And you can see that the implant and the chip is nicely positioned. Um, underneath the retina and can communicate with the intact uh, retinal tissue uh, to uh, try to restore some vision. Next slide, please. I'm going to show just a quick video here. This is, uh, I don't know if you guys can hear the sound, uh, but it's in French anyway, so unless your French is very good, uh, the subtitles will be a benefit. Here, this is a patient with the device in France uh, demonstrating that they can orient this bar in the correct manner. And then here's the, another patient here identifying letters uh, that they previously uh, could, couldn't see. Uh, and this is being done uh, after the implantation of, and use of the device with their artificial vision. So it's actually quite remarkable. Here they're identifying a V. And you can see that even with different types of letters, whether they're round or whether they're square, they can identify these different letters quite, with quite accuracy. So it's, it's a very promising treatment. Um, I'm again quite excited about this treatment. Uh, and we have many collaborative efforts going on in our department. Uh, I think that, you know, certainly there are advancements that are needed, particularly for many forms of macular degeneration, even for the early forms. And it, it requires an all, all hands on deck approach with scientists, engineers, uh, pharmacologists, and eye surgeons. And um, I think under Dr. Sahel's leadership, we've been uh, really collaborative um, and we're doing some really exciting things here. I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Freiberg for some closing remarks and then open up to your questions. Well, I'd like to thank everyone for a great overview on macular degeneration. I think we all can see how complex everything is and how everything has to work together. And so do the researchers have to work together to push things along. It wasn't so many years ago that we couldn't even go inside the eye, and now we're putting chips under the retina. Dr. Martel talks like it's a very simple procedure but it's, it takes a lot of training to get skilled enough to be able to do it. And we have so many places and so many uh, goals to achieve. 
we've done a lot for macular degeneration over the years, but I think we have just begun. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you everybody. Um, there's a lot of information because there's a lot of things going on in the department, I know, for, for people, uh, for, for research in this area. Um, and, and certainly this is, uh, you know, uh, an important topic for everybody. I know I want to get to your questions. So we'll go through all the questions. If there are some questions remaining, we will uh, try to answer those via email, but we will end at the end of the hour. Uh, first question here. Um, uh, any news regarding use of microsiline to try to show damage due to macular degeneration or RP? Not sure who wants to start with that. I can try if you want. Uh, this is Jose Sahel. Uh, so this is one of the approaches that tries to target the actually the immune system. So minocycline is like an antibiotic, but it's also targeting some sort of inflammatory cells that can invade the retina in in the process. Actually, Dr. Sinha was mentioning that, and it is one of his areas of research. So there has been a trial, an early trial that showed some potential benefit, but this has not yet been confirmed. So this is not a drug which we would have advised to take because it has to be validated to a very large study, but uh, it goes in the direction of mod modulating the immune system in the retina, which is a very important process in aging. So one of the promises for the future, but not the main one. Thank you. Do you feel the brand Numaqualla vitamin is better than the AREDS? Yeah, I don't really want to advertise for any brand especially, but uh, Dr. Freiberg, if you want to comment. You know, there are a lot of vitamins that are being offered. I think it's important to show that, that they are actually clinically proven to be useful. Um, I, I'd like to stick with the AREDS trial as a basis, but there certainly can be additional micronutrients and vitamins that might turn out to be useful. But as Dr. Sahel mentioned, I wouldn't necessarily recommend one over the other, except for the AREDS. Now, what about secondhand smoke as opposed to smoking? I'd like to take a shot at that. Um, there was a very interesting study done at Duke University that actually had a smoking machine and that they had, uh, they had primates that uh, were susceptible to macular degeneration. And, you know, obviously the monkeys weren't s smoking, but it turned out that those that had the smoke put in their cages definitely showed uh, a deterioration in their disease compared to ones that were not. So uh, as far as whether it's clinically significant in the general sense, probably unless, it's probably not such a big thing now, but you know, it wasn't so many years ago that people smoked profusely. And if you were in a closed space with a smoker for many, many months or years, that probably could have an effect. I imagine it would, thank you very much. So please also clarify when the eye vitamins are most effective before at onset or during treatment? Well, the vitamins that were tested for the ARES, they were tested in very early stages and all the way up to people that were more uh, advanced. I think it's very true that people that have uh, intermediate uh, macular degeneration definitely will benefit. But I think as a general rule, you, you would make a, maybe guess that they might be helpful even in the earlier stages. I don't think it's wrong to take them in the early stage, but I'm not sure that you're going to get a real definitive benefit. Okay. I, I, obviously, vitamins are a, a, a top leading question here because uh, I think it is peop, real, people realize it is something that uh, could be preventative. Um, is there any over-the-counter vitamins available today that include all of the minerals needed to protect the eye from AMD? I think we maybe answered that before that there's not necessarily a, a brand that we'd recommend, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. All right. So um, is there any genetic risk 
to developing AMD? I'd like to know that. I, I mentioned my mother had it. Yeah, I think there is. Uh, doesn't mean that if your mother or your father had AMD, you will have AMD. But uh, there is some uh, very strong evidence already. Several genes have been identified. There are three main genes that are associated with the disease. Uh, it, this should be viewed as risk factors. Uh, and we mentioned, for example, smoking. If you have one of these gene defects and you are smoking, your risk is increased tremendously. So there are several. They all point in the direction of the inflammatory response to the deposits under the retina. And uh, they can account for up to 60 or 70 percent of the cause of the FMND. So, the, yes, this is a, a disease that has a genetic component, but the risk factors, the food, the light exposure, and smoking are very important too. So, it's not just a genetic disease, it's a combination of factors. Well, thank you. What about the 4C home device from uh, Notovision as a diagnostic tool? Well, this is not a diagnostic tool. It's a tool that is used for follow-up of patients that are affected with the disease. The concept is that uh, the decision to do injections uh, in the wet form of AMD is based on imaging. And so the idea of developing systems to test at home the vision, so there are two ways to do that. One is to test visual acuity or visual function. The other one is to image the retina. So it's an interesting concept. Uh, it has to be done properly and the home-based devices still have to be validated. So we are actually, I'm talking to these people about see if we, we can implement this approach uh, in the US. Uh, but uh, currently, this is more an exploratory approach, which is kind of promising, goes in the direction of home-based uh, follow-up of patients, which is something we are developing very actively in the department. Thank you. It was mentioned that the vision restoration efforts were focused originally on dry AMD. Can they also work for wet AM AMD? Maybe Dr. Martel, you want to talk on that? Sure, yeah, I'll take that question. Um, so. For, for the artificial retina, when we implant the retinal chip, um, for now, we think that it will work best in patients with atrophic macular degeneration. The reason for that is that in patients with severe loss of vision with the wet form, there's often scar tissue that develops underneath the retina. In addition, uh, we think that those abnormal blood vessels that can leak and bleed, if they happen when the chip is under the retina, it may compromise the functionality of the chip. So for now, in the early stages of uh, trying to restore vision, we wanna select patients that have uh, the best potential benefit, uh, perhaps for, uh, for the device. And those patients would be the, the dry form. Now that's not to say that in the future, we might have an artificial retina implant that works equally as well for patients with wet macular degeneration. Um, but for now, uh, the mainstay treatment for wet macular degeneration uh, is the uh, injection therapies. Now, there are certainly other treatments on the horizon. Um, you know, I think that ultimately in, there, are, there are different stages of wet macular degeneration. In the early stages, the injections work quite well. And as long as uh, we can control the wet component of the macular degeneration with the injections, uh, the progress of the visual impairment um, can be halted or slowed down considerably from its natural history. Um, in more advanced stages where there's been significant tissue damage and scarring from wet macular degeneration, we definitely need some better treatments. We need, um, we need to, to really uh, enhance uh, the research and the treatments uh, when there's just uh, tissue damage and we just don't, the injections don't really uh, do much at that stage. Um, so it's something that we're working on. I think ultimately it will require some type of vision restoration therapy, whether it be stem cell um, or artificial retina. Those are the leading candidates. All right, thank you. We're gonna uh, have three, three of your questions answered at once here because three of you asked the same question. Is light from computer screens, phones, et cetera, also harmful to the retina? I think we're all spending more time than we usually do on these devices. 
Yeah, so my group in Paris, we have been working on that and we showed on the different models that uh, blue light and ultra ultraviolet light can have a toxic effect on ret retinal pigment epithelium and the, the cells in the retina. So uh, it would be very difficult to prove that in the clinical setting. You would need a study for 40 years in a large number of patients to prove that finally in the clinic, but there is some evidence from uh, studies in people living in outside environments and with light, high light exposure that this could be toxic. So protecting from from light and there are several ways to filter the blue light and the ultraviolet light uh, is recommended, uh, although we cannot make it absolutely mandatory. Uh, for example, after cataract surgery, now we are implanting lenses that are filtering the blue and the UV light. And uh, this is also possible with spectacles. There are a few that are adapted for screens and uh, actually there is even on every single cell phone a way to have a protection. Uh, I'm not saying that this is a medically recommendable, it's just a nice thing to have. Uh, there is no absolutely strong evidence for that, but experimental evidence shows that blue and UV light can be toxic. Wonderful. Well, I did say that we would uh, try to end here at the hour. It is just there now, but there is, I think, one question that would be good to end on. And, and I think uh, the last one here sums it up. What are the largest, largest obstacles to your research besides funding? Well, the, the largest obstacle is, is time. We are very uh, busy with uh, clinical care and we have to bring together a lot of skills together. So funding is certainly a, a major thing, but you excluded that from the question. It's really the ability to bring people together. I think in Pittsburgh, we are very privileged because with the new building upcoming, the ability to bring together a lot of talents. We recruited more than 20 new faculty. You heard a few of them today with Dr. Debashish and he mentioned several names. This is happening. The real thing is that science is very complex. You need to bring all the pieces together. We are targeting and dealing with big questions, but each big question has to be dissected into smaller questions, but we have to keep a big picture. So this is what we are trying to do. It takes a lot of years, it takes patience, but it takes also a persistence. And this is what we try to bring together, not just being smart, but just work hard and persistently in that together. Okay. Thank you again. This is, you know, it's a, it's a very complex topic. We know the, the science is very complex, but it's very interesting and extremely exciting for everybody that's deal, dealing with uh, this, this, you know, this age-related macular degeneration, which is obviously very, very prevalent. So thank you all, um, and thank you for all of our attendees. Um, as we sign off here, I did not get to all the questions, but we will try to answer those questions that we can via email. Um, and, um, and then uh, you have Craig Smith's uh, email address and your invitation. You can send any other questions to us there. You also receive a survey, as I mentioned, tomorrow that you may, may please fill out. And uh, we'll be bringing these, these programs to you every other week. Look forward to the next one. Many topics, I'm sure we'll have more opportunity to talk about more of the, the conditions that affect the retina. Thank you all very, very much. Have a great day.